And we had a nice transition into urban planning from the uh, parking question earlier. So um, my name is Spencer Gardner. Uh, I am a consultant working with People for Bikes. Uh, People for Bikes is a national advocacy organization, a nonprofit that um, advocates for better bike facilities across the United States. Uh, we've developed a tool that we call the Bike Network Analysis Tool. And uh, I'll talk a little bit about that, and then we'll talk about some uh, how it relates to OSM specifically. So I work for Tool Design Group. We are a planning and engineering firm. Uh, we focus on bicycle and pedestrian infrastructure. Uh, we have offices around the country. And as I said, uh, we've been working with People for Bikes, which is based here in Boulder. Um, if you didn't get out and ride your bike here, this is one of the best cities in the United States for biking. So I highly recommend you get a ride in while you can. So one of the problems with measuring connectivity for bikes is that uh, it's easy to measure the distance or the total number of bike lanes in your city, but it doesn't tell you a whole lot about what you can get to. So you can end up with a situation like this, where a bike lane uh, may count towards your mileage of bike lanes, but doesn't actually get you where you're trying to go, unless you wanted to run into a guardrail. Um, you can also have bike lanes that uh, may technically connect you to where you want to go, but they dump you off into a busy street that is probably not very comfortable for bicycling. So the bicycle network analysis tool was built to address this problem in the question of uh, what, what does bike connectivity mean and what can you get to on a bike in your city? Uh, there's a website, peopleforbikes.org slash BNA, where you can go and see the score of cities from around the United States. Um, there's more information about the methodology there. You can also click through to, to, our, uh, to, the, to the source code. So the project is an open source project. And um, as I've hinted at, we make heavy use of OpenStreetMap data in the tool. So we'll talk a little bit about the methodology. And the first is we need to talk about what uh, we mean by traffic stress. So let's do a little unscientific experiment here. How many of you have no interest whatsoever in riding a bike. And you don't have to be embarrassed about that, it's okay. Raise of hands. We got a couple of hands up. Uh, how many of you would feel comfortable riding in a situation like this? Okay. It's a decent amount of people. How many of you would feel comfortable riding in maybe a situ situation more like this? More hands are going up. All right, how about like this? Even more hands. And then the last, if you're interested in riding a bike, my guess is that you're probably very comfortable in that last situation. Uh, traffic stress is an attempt to uh, rate the roads that are used by bicyclists for how well they accommodate those bicyclists. And uh, as the name indicates, uh, in particular, how, how uh, stressful those roadways are for a cyclist. So, um, by the way, uh, there is some uh, survey-based scientific research that's been done um, about the types of cyclists, and as the pictures show here, uh, the theory is there are basically kind of four types of people. Uh, about a third of people, 37% uh, from the research that's been done, are not really interested in riding a bike at all. And then about 7% are what are called the strong and fearless. Uh, those are the people that are willing to go out in uh, pretty heavy traffic, maybe ride on a road that doesn't have a bike lane. They're comfortable or at least uh, willing to mix with cars uh, uh, pretty regularly and maybe even at higher speeds than most people. About 5% are what are called the enthused and confident. So these would be people who are comfortable on a bike. Um, they probably ride regularly. They'd be comfortable in a bike lane, even on a busy street, but maybe not riding on the busiest streets and without uh, some kind of dedicated bike facility. So that leaves us with 51%, so about half of the population, that fall in the interested but concerned. These are people who would love to bicycle. Maybe they do on occasion, but they really don't like being around cars, especially at higher speeds, and lots of cars. So. Uh, 
That's kind of the theory behind traffic stress. And as I said, uh, there's a rating system that has been developed to kind of rate facilities for, for these categories. Um, if you remove the people who, don't, who have no interest in bicycling because a rating system doesn't really matter for them, we add another one on the end that we call 8 to 80. That would be uh, facilities that are appropriate for my daughter to ride on and my grandma to ride on. So uh, the BNA tool is mostly concerned with the low stress end of the spectrum. So the interested but concerned rider and the 8 to 80 rider. We want to make sure that cities um, build facilities and not just facilities but networks to connect people to places they want to go and in particular the interested but concerned type of person and maybe their children. Uh, traffic stress considers um, primarily two different elements of the roadway. The first is the segment of the roadway, so the stretch of road that you are riding on. And there are three main factors that contribute to the stress that you might feel as a bicyclist. The first is the speed. This is um, generally measured by the speed limit of the roadway, although as probably 100% of you know, when you drive a car, you probably don't actually go the speed limit. So um, that's, a, that's a problem that we've come across in that there's usually not good data on what the actual speed of traffic is. So we use speed limit. Um, it's not perfect, but that's, that's uh, what we use currently, and that's what is pretty standard practice in the industry. Uh, the second is the bike facility. So is there a bike lane? Is there not a bike lane? Is there a protected bike lane? What, what does the bike facility look like if there is one? Because the different types of facilities can affect your, the stress that you feel in riding on the road. A greater level of separation from traffic is going to reduce your stress level so that you might be willing to ride on a road with higher levels of traffic or higher speeds that you otherwise wouldn't be comfortable on. And then the number of travel lanes. Uh, the theory behind this is, first of all, it's a good proxy for the volume of traffic. If you have more lanes, you have more cars. Also, there's a, a concept called turbulence, which is that just the added number of travel lanes adds to the complexity of the roadway, and that that can actually have an effect on the stress that you feel. So those are the three main factors that we're looking at on these segments. The other factor, and this is really important for uh, OSM and routing applications, is what happens at an intersection. Uh, the first factor you're looking at is the speed limit, but again, uh, again the speed limit, but of the cross traffic. So a high speed roadway that you need to cross might be uh, stressful to you. Uh, the second is the intersection control and the crossing treatment. Is there a traffic signal? If there's a traffic signal, then as far as the intersection itself is concerned, that's not a stressful crossing because cross traffic is being stopped and you're given the right of way to then proceed across the intersection. Um, there are other treatments as well that you could consider. For example, um, median crossing islands that allow you to cross the, the road in two stages. Um, the third factor that we look at is the number of lanes that you're crossing. And uh, this relates to the width of the roadway that you're crossing. The longer you have to cross traffic, the more you're exposed to a potential conflict, and so that increases the stress level. Uh, traffic stress also works on the principle of the weakest link. So the, the idea is that if I need to get from my house in the bottom left to my grandma's house in the bottom right, and I have to go on a two block stretch that's highly stressful, and that that's the only real way for me to get from my house to grandma's house, I'm gonna rule out that trip, at least on a bike. I'll take the bus, I'll take a car, but I'm probably not gonna bike. Uh, now this is not always true for all cyclists. Again, we have the four types, but for the interested but concerned and the eight to 80, this is a pretty safe assumption to make. Most people end up not biking, not because the street in front of their house is stressful, but because somewhere along the way is stressful. So that weakest link principle becomes really important for routing applications as well. Uh, there are other um, considerations that we have to make for bicyclists that don't really work uh, when you're talking about uh, transportation routing in a, in a vehicle. Um, this one is important because in the transportation network as we conceive of it, for the most part, is what you can get to in a car. So every grid, every square in this grid is on the transportation network. You are connected. If you're driving a car, you can get everywhere. We've basically made that a, a possibility through the, um, the way that we build our roadways. 
on the bike network, you may not be able to reach everything, at least not if you're worried about stress, um, traffic stress. So in the example you can see, some of these squares don't have a low stress facility and therefore an interested but concerned cyclist would not be willing to ride along that street to get to where they need to go. In other cases, you may have a facility that serves a particular area, as you can see on the left and the right side, but the way to get there is so circuitous that you end up ruling out that trip again because it's, it's too far. If I have to go eight miles out of my way to get to the barber shop, I'm going to get my hair cut somewhere else or I'll drive a car. Um, this is illustrated here with schools. So in the car network, you can get to five schools. But in the low-stress bicycling network, you can only get to two schools. So this is one of the key problems that we were trying to address with the bicycle network analysis tool. Um, we rate, as I hinted at with schools, we rate different, uh, different types of features, and we've categorized them into these six. So people would be getting uh, access to other people. We use US Census data for population to see how many other people you can access within a bikeable distance, um, and then give you a score for that category. Opportunity would be things like jobs, uh, educational opportunities, social services, um, those kinds of things. Core services would be grocery stores, uh, medical facilities, um, uh, important uh, important needs kind of things. Retail is self-explanatory. Recreation involves things like parks, community centers, um, and then we also look at recreational trails or paths. And then transit is uh, high capacity transit stations, so rail stations or major bus transfer centers, those kinds of uh, transit facilities. So we generate scores for all of these categories. And we've done that, as I said, in, in uh, cities around the United States. So what can we do with this information? Well, first of all, you can map traffic stress. This is a map of uh, Madison, Wisconsin. That's where I live. Uh, the blue is uh, areas that, or roads that we consider to be low stress. And the orange, uh, kind of orangish red, is uh, streets that are considered high stress. So um, you could look at the map and start to pick out a route um, just, just based on the, the ratings that come from the traffic stress calculations that we make on the data. You can also do the scores within the area, and this is where those six categories come in. Um, we aggregate those to create an overall score, so you can see Madison, Wisconsin's score, for example, is 43. Um, and you can see how that score varies across the city. So the isthmus, which is kind of in the center of the map, if you don't know Madison, it's squished between a couple of lakes. Uh, the isthmus itself scores pretty well. You can actually access a lot of things on a bike if you're living in or if your uh, origin is somewhere in that area. But as you get out to the further flung areas, your access degrades. You can get to fewer things um, and you can't get, them, get to them as easily. Uh, you can also compare areas. This is all um, functionality that's available on the website. So uh, I chose three cities here. Uh, you can see how they compare against each other in all of the different categories. Um, another uh, feature that is helpful that comes from the data that we produce in the analysis is looking at a bike shed. So in the example on the left, we're looking at Longview, Texas. In the example on the right, we're looking at Groningen, Netherlands. You can see how an, uh, the blue is what you can access in the bike. The red is what you can access in a car. And in Longview, the uh, stress of crossing some of those major arterials that bound that blue box restrict you from being able to access the area outside of it. So I'm going to skip through some of this and get to some good news and bad news about OpenStreetMap. Uh, the good news is that a lot of bike uh, tagging schemes have already been worked out, even for so-called innovative infrastructure here in the United States. And that's largely because other countries, um, especially in Europe, are decades beyond us in bike facilities. So things like protected cycle lanes and others, other facility types have already been worked out in a pretty well-established tagging scheme. The bad news is we're decades behind other countries in building better bike facilities. Uh, the other bad news is that not all bike facilities are covered adequately in OpenStreetMap. Here are a couple of examples that I'll go through pretty quickly. Um, an advisory bike lane. So this is a, basically a bike lane, but with dashed lines, which indicate to a car that if there's an oncoming car, they can uh, incur uh, or encroach into that bike lane after they've yielded to any bikes that are there and give way to the oncoming traffic. Uh, 
It's a nice design, and uh, it's not entirely clear from documentation on OSM Wiki how to tag that. I think we could work something out, but there's not really, it doesn't seem like there's an established scheme at this point. Buffered bike lanes is another one. So a buffered bike lane is a regular bike lane with some painted buffers on either side or both sides. So uh, is that cycleway equals buffered lane? That's one tag scheme that we've seen. Cycleway equals lane, cycleway buffer equals yes. Or is that cycleway lane, cycleway buffer equals both because there's a bu buffer on both sides in this example. So um, I don't have time to talk about our mapathon, but we do have a community outreach uh, effort that we're undergoing and trying to encourage cities around the country to improve their open street map data. Uh, thank you. I, I also wanted to just add quickly that People for Bikes is actually looking to hire a coder with some OSM experience. There's information on the job board if you want to look into that. So thank you. Are there any questions? Hello. So for the, the, the map or the work you're doing in Madison, have you considered doing some travel demand forecasting for uh, bicycle demand to see how the map would change? Uh, that's not a core part of the tool. That's certainly something that people for bikes would like to investigate. And I can say as the work that I do as, a, as an urban planner, um, I work in communities around the country creating bike plans. That's something that we're starting to incorporate into our plans. So the idea is you can plug in, uh, you can see the effect on the connectivity score by building, for example, a bike path that crosses a river or something. Um, yes, that's certainly something that's on the radar. Hi, really great talk, thank you. I was curious if you're familiar with the Ride Report app, which allows users to report the stress they experience and then creates a overall stress map uh, for the cycle, cycling in the city. Yes, I am familiar with that. Uh, we've actually talked with Ride Report. We're very, very familiar with them and have a good relationship. There are talks of using their data to, to ground truth the stress scores that we're producing out of the app. We don't, we don't use it currently, but we're certainly talking with them and that's something that we'd like to do. Uh, my question was basically the same, but it was using popular heat maps of cycles, people that on roads where they actually cycle even though they're four lane, but there's been enough bikes that they're avoided even though there's not bike lanes. So rather than having to report the score using heat maps. Uh, so like from Strava or right. something along those lines? Yeah, so one of the problems we found with Strava is that um, you might see a lot of use, for example, on a four lane uh, highway or something, but that doesn't tell us a lot about the interested but concerned who probably aren't biking at all. Um, so we, we have incorporated Strava into some planning work that I've done. It wasn't, uh, it's not related to this tool. Um, and there were discussions about how Strava data might come in, and I wouldn't rule out maybe some future use, but currently we don't really look at it for that reason. Are shoulders considered as <clears throat> bike facility in kind of less urban areas? So this is, brings up an interesting problem we have, which is uh, traffic stress is highly sensitive to the speed of traffic. And when you get out into rural areas, uh, just by nature, the, the, the speed limits go up and it shows as highly stressful. Now that may be accurate in the sense that uh, if I'm an interested but concerned person, uh, like my wife who likes to ride but is mostly off street, um, she may not be wanting to ride in that rural, er rural area, but it doesn't tell us a whole lot about which rural roads might be better for bicycling. So that's an element that we would like to incorporate into the BNA as well. I, so I, I guess I would say at this point, it's uh, somewhat focused on urban areas, um, but that, that's, uh, that's something that we would like to address. And it is, it is a concern. Yes, uh, we're done with time, but we, we can still keep on speaking on, on, on the break. Okay, yeah. Catch me be afterwards. 3.15.